Welcome to the Tomosi Business Training Series. The basis of these sessions is to support the Tomosi Group staff and management to raise their capabilities and performance. This is also a platform to share our experience with young entrepreneurs making an effort to build their startups in Uganda and across Africa. Today's training session is about national unity and straightening the bonds of East Africa as our regional and African heritage. Good morning, my name is Odrek Rwabogo. I'm coming back to you after a week of the teaching we had uh, the previous week uh, to emphasize some of the things we shared about nation building, about media, and generally about collective responsibility we have as citizens to ensure that whatever each one of us does, it's like a stream, streams that join to create a lake. So this morning I'm reminded that what we confront, what we focus on, what we speak out against, what we don't sweep under the carpet grows us as a country. It changes our country, uh, regardless of social pressure to not say something or do anything about it. But when we choose to confront it as society, as the individuals in a community, on the, we end on the other side in a positive way, healed, and we stop problems that can come out of what we sweep under the carpet. Yesterday I was reminded of <clears throat> what we did as a country when we openly confronted the scourge of HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS was a pandemic like the coronavirus we're facing uh, today. We didn't have vaccines. We didn't even have science on how to deal with HIV AIDS. We simply shouted like in the olden days when an, a lion would attack a village the villagers would come out and shout and say, it is there, it is here, and the animal would eventually abandon the village because of the many noises uh, that have come up. When we confronted HIV AIDS and talked about it openly, we achieved three <coughs> important things. I remember in 1991, I had just joined university. The infection rate for HIV AIDS at that time was 64%. You can imagine 64% of our population, or 64% of anything uh, as an infection rate, epidemiologists will tell you it is a danger zone for that community. By 2003, when we had our first born, these are 12 years. I'm going to university, I am married by 2003. By 2003, when we had our first born, that infection rate had come down to 6%. From 64 in 10 to 12 years to 4%. The second thing we did, and we didn't do this with vaccines, we simply spoke out. The other thing that came out of speaking openly against HIV AIDS is that we began to delay the age of first sexual contact. First sexual contact by teenagers was delayed further we narrowed the age between girls and their sexual partners. We, we, the second thing, the third thing we did is that the frequency for multiple partners reduced. And so we brought healing to the nation by speaking about an evil instead of sweeping it under the carpet. Now likewise, when we sweep under the carpet tribal talk, you know, there's increasing tribal talk in our country um, that I hear on social media, um, false attacks on innocent people simply because of where they come from or who they are associated with. When we all sweep this under the carpet, knowing that people are using tribes and religions in the hunt for jobs, they are hunting for political positions, but there is no way this tribal talk can build a greater good. We hurt our future. Now, let me be very clear at the start that tribe, which is a group of people sharing customs and language, is not a bad thing. In fact, tribe can help in preservation of language. 
preservation of particular customs, modernizing a community. Now, a tribe is good if it seeks to preserve what is good. To use a tribe in a wrong way is to use it in a chauvinistic way, stereotyping other people, or to sort of depict other people who are not of that tribe as if they are foreigners. I saw a clip circulating from a young man. Wali Jakaba Katari Manya Yesofu. Echisokirwa kodala, omkulembesa agendo kuja, tajja kuganya mawanga gano wa manga. Mm. Ndi muna Rwandanga liyeli soka, ndi muna Kenya chakubiri, mm. ndi murundi, ndi musawo sudani, okubela muno, ni mbakari ya mguanga Uganda, ebi nitu ina mbitunuli yenga vigenda kubajibu wako. Mm -hmm. Echisoka kumawanga ago gemenye ni wangu kubademu wako lembelo kuja nunga we muringa muli wabai basi mguanga Uganda. National ID ba jakuzi ba jako mkulembeza agendo kudako. Mubele na bipalati ba kulembeza mguanga Uganda. Mm. Ola mugendo fuke mwomboze. Mm -hmm. Muganda wa mwebu wa zenga tia basanga wano. Muganda ni mjisimu zake ebisoto. Botuna ingila mchigambo federo. Omu naruanda ye na wali ate kwa kude gatuna. Mpulida. Asale nsalo. Ate siga nori ya upresenti wali niti haa. Mbubata ya gala kubata mchimpo woze. Kiri zanti ya bantu ngeenda kuwa kutikira mba kule etere. Mm. Echo mchilindi ya bantu wanda bali muguanga. Nga mochi atunulile nisonga nga buwezili ni muzitu walanga za kusaga. Kumukule mbeza agendo kuda kuta jia kubwa mochisa. Ajaba tikaba zeyo. Aba tuwale iruanda. Who is the son of one of our senior leaders. Basically saying that some people who are in our constitution should return where they came from. That they are foreigners. They have been here for the last 200 years. And then he says, when they leave, even those who look like them should follow them. Now, I know no politician will confront this because politicians are interested in votes. I know no business person will spend their time dealing with this. But God put it on my heart. He gave me a verse uh, yesterday that says a man who is in honor yet does not understand is like the beasts that perish. A man who is in honor because you are in honor because you are created in the image of God and yet you do not understand, you are like beasts that perish. It's from the book of Psalms, chapter 49, verse 20. Just below that verse, there's another one in, in Psalm 53, verse 4, that says, there are they are in great fear where no fear was. So we're stalking fear where there was not supposed to be fear. And we also sort of let ignorance, lack of wisdom, prevail in our social media and disturb the peace that our country and the unity that our country you know, has been growing in in the last uh, couple of years. So for me to demonstrate today in this session the value of unity across the Great Lakes region. I would like this morning to focus on four kings. Four kings who most of you, or should I say some of you who care to know the history of our country, our region, uh, might, be, might have knowledge of. The first one is King Mutesa, the first. King Mutesa governed from the year uh, 1856 and he died in 1884. King Mutesa, for some of you who might know, he was called Mukabia because he was underestimated as a young man um, among the sons of Kabaka Suna. And when he took power, I think there was succession battles succession battles that left some of his siblings dead and uh, rival groups. But that underestimation did not stop him from becoming one of the most important kings in the history of Buganda. The other king I want us to speak about is King Rumanyika, King Rumanyika, who governed uh, from 1855 and died in 1884.
King Rumanyika is the king of the people called the Banyambo in this place, in this place called Karagwe, right here. Karagwe, northwestern Tanzania. The kingdom of Karagwe, when the Luo Bito dynasty came from the north, the last man of the Batres called Ruhinda, eventually, history teaches us that one of the last Mutrezes eventually came and established their presence here. And out of this place, uh, the first king of Nkore called Nkuba Yarama was a descendant of Ruhinda who would attack Karagwe. But these Vanyambo um, are connected to the Vanyoro right here. They are connected to Baganda here. They are connected to Ankole, but they are today in northwestern Tanzania. The third king that I want us to speak about today is called King Mutambuka. King Mutambuka. This is from Mkore. He governed from 1839 and died in 1867. King Mutambuka is remembered by many of Anyankore as the king who fought wars and expanded the borders of Unkore. His son called Bachwa attacked um, that area of a man today we know as Nsansa, Kabumbuli Nsansa, which is Kochi. He attacked Karagwe. Uh, he attacked the present day Mawogola and expanded Nkore, and his son is the one who eventually, in 1893, 1888, would meet the first Muzungu through a representative, Henry Morton Stanley. The final king I want to use as an example is King Ruawijiri of Rwanda, who governed from 18... 53 to 1895. Now, I want, with a sense of curiosity, for you to see the periods in which these people died. You see Mutesa passed away in 1884, Rumanika 1884, Mutambuka 1867, Ruawujiri 1895. King Ruawujiri of Rwanda was a king who expanded this kingdom attacking Eastern Congo, attacking Ankore. In fact, the battle, the last battle he fought was 1893 against Ankore, and attacked this borderline with Burundi in an area called Jisaka. But when you see the years they passed away, there are four things I want to share with you so you see the connectivity of our country and really understand that tribe is not a good basis to build, because there's a lot of fusion because between these countries I'm speaking about in the map, and that fusion, I only picked the late 19th century. But if I went back to 1500, that fusion would even surprise you how connected we are. But there are a couple of things that I want to share with you on these four uh, kings. First, they were the first to make contact with the West. Largely, I think apart from Mutambuka, who died in 1867, whose son, Ntare V, eventually would send a representative in 1889 to meet Henry Morton Stanley. The rest had contact, first contact with the West. They saw these new visitors who would never want to go away. They were the first to get in touch with these visitors from the West, who would never leave. They were the first to be faced with new technology, the greater Great Lakes region, uh, East and Central Africa. The second thing is that they were the first with alternative ways. The first is, let's say, contact with the, with the world. And this contact, they reacted differently to this contact. For example, King Mutesa, in 1841, the first Arab to visit Uganda was called Ahmed bin Ibrahim. 
Ahmed bin Ibrahim. I think 1841, that must have been Sunnah, the father of Mutesa. But the influence of the rest of the world on Mutesa was that I would play the French against the English, against the Arabs, and switch sides in order to protect my kingdom. Little did he know that neither the French nor the British were interested in his kingdom. They were imperialists looking for resources for their industrialization at the time. The fight was between an emerging, an insurgent Germany that had been reunited in 1870 and it was searching for its own place in the imperial world and therefore whether you played one against the other, the point is that they all want to eat you for lunch. Now, eventually we know that Kabaka Mwanga, his son, who would try to fight when it was too late, he was arrested and deported and he died. We got to be careful ostracizing people simply because of where they come from, because in their blood we are there. In our blood they are there. We are same people. I thank you. God bless you. Enjoyed this session? We would like to hear from you. Please give your feedback using the Google form attached or email us at infoatomosigroup.ug and visit our website on www.tomosigroup.ug or tune into the Tomosi Business Series on Facebook and YouTube to enjoy more of our weekly training podcasts. You can also visit our offices at Tomosi Business Park, Luzira, Port Bell Road, 